So you're telling me that these people actually know better and we know that they know better because of what they say in front of Senate estimates and and Senate inquiries, and yet they continue to say the other in public. Yeah, so that, so so they know that these products are less harmful. They they openly admit that. Hello, my name is Topher Field. Today, my guest is Brian Marlow from Legalize Vaping Australia. We're talking about nicotine, heroin, cocaine, and other hard drugs, and why Australia is the only place on earth to treat nicotine vaping as though it's worse than smoking cigarettes. If you like this sort of content, please go to tofafield.net and join my email list so I can keep in touch with you even if I do get cancelled. Make sure in the meantime, before I get cancelled, you like, subscribe, leave a comment. Now here's Brian. Well, Brian Marlow from Legalise Vaping Australia, thank you so much for uh, talking with me today. No worries. Thank you for having me, mate. Now, Brian, for a lot of people, this is not a subject they necessarily pay attention to. For a lot of smokers, even, who might be looking to quit, trying to quit, they've been told that vaping is actually often worse than smoking. That's something that's often held to be true here in Australia, but that's not consistent with what actually the vast majority of other governments and other sort of health departments around the world are saying, is it? No, no, it's not. And it's actually unfortunate that a lot of people in Australia incorrectly believe that vaping is more harmful than cigarettes. So... For, for background, uh, vaping was initially invented by a pharmacist who wanted to find a way to help people quit smoking and sort of mimic the act of smoking. Uh, and how a vape works is it heats a liquid that contains nicotine in it. Nicotine is the active ingredient that smokers are addicted to. Uh, but because you're, in, you're just heating a liquid, you're, in, you're creating a vapour, which is then inhaled. Uh, and you're not burning a tobacco leaf. And the tobacco leaf, when you burn it, is what releases all the carcinogens and all the tar that actually makes smokers sick in the long term and kills uh, it kills two and three long-term users and kills about 52 mm-hmm. Australians every single day. Mm-hmm. Now, there's extensive evidence from around the world that vaping is at least 95% less harmful than cigarettes. Uh, Public Health England has released annual reports on this and every single time they review this information they find that exact same figure 95% it's actually slightly higher they say it's up to 97 but as a conservative Mm -hmm. estimate they say it's 95% less harmful so we're in a bizarre situation where in Australia to access a product that is significantly less harmful than cigarettes and doesn't kill 52 Australians every single day you need to see a doctor and get a prescription but to go and access a product where you're effectively inhaling a mini bushfire uh, you can buy that on every street corner. And, you know, I think you should be able to buy those products as an adult, but I think you should also be able to buy vaping products as an adult without a doctor. Yeah. Look, you, you're talking to a, a regular cigar smoker here. I smoke one, sometimes two in a week. Uh, and it's that the statistics tell me very clearly that that's not a meaningful risk to my health. Uh, but if I was a regular cigarette smoker, if I was in that category where you're consuming multiple sticks a day and it really is starting to present a risk, I would personally be very interested in vaping because of the fact that it mimics that action. It gives you that same sort of a ritual. Uh, yeah. Is there anywhere else in the world that treats vaping and nicotine specifically in vaping the way that we do it here? No. There's, so there's not a single country that requires you to see a doctor and get a prescription to access vaping products. There yeah. are countries that have banned them. So we are in good standing with countries like, uh, I believe, Jordan and North Korea. Uh, and mm. the, uh, the, the CCP has banned some vaping products. So yeah. that's the kind yeah. of company that we're in. Uh, we've, yeah, we've, we've, definitely, effectively, we've effectively got a de facto ban on easily accessing vaping products. Uh, yeah. If you don't go and see a doctor, you can technically potentially be fined, which is insane. Well, if there's one thing that I've always wanted, it's to be uh, compared in the same breath with the likes of North Korea and the CCP. So I guess Australia can really sort of put that that feather in its cap. But I, I guess this begs the question, why? If other countries are seeing vaping, vaping with nicotine specifically as a life-saving tool to help people stop smoking cigarettes, why are we such an outlier? Why the difference here? Look, there's, there's, there's the public discourse around why and then there's probably what the, the, the crux of the issue is. So I'll, I'll lead with the public discourse around it first. So our organisation has been around for a fair few years now. We've met with federal politicians and state politicians from all sides of the aisle, Liberal, National, Labor, minor parties, Greens, everything. For a lot of Labor MPs uh, and Greens MPs, their, their stance is, well, it was... You know, the progressive side of politics that enacted a whole bunch of policies on tobacco products, so the plain packaging, you know, the pictures of Diane Bryan and all those mm. sorts of things on like cigarettes, sky-high excise rates uh, and all these things that are designed to get people to quit smoking. And their argument is that 
all those policies help people reduce smoking rates. Uh, right. So therefore, if they legalise another method of people to access nicotine, they're just swapping one addiction for the other. Uh, so it's better to be precautionary, not legalise these products as a consumer product, only allow people to get them through a very narrow pathway through their GP uh, if they absolutely need them and go from there. But the flip side is that there's a huge black market. Uh, when you create regulations when over a million people want to access a product, they're going to find them uh, and they're going to buy them from people who don't necessarily sell them in you know, the appropriate way. Uh, that's their sort of forward-facing argument. That being said, when you then talk to them privately uh, and in confidence, tobacco excise generates something around $13 billion a year for the federal government. Yeah. Uh, the average cigarette, if you buy if, if you buy a, a pack of cigarettes and it costs $40, roughly about $35 or $36 is going straight to the government. Now, yeah. effectively what they're doing is they're taxing addiction. They have reduced smoking rates to a certain point. You're at about between 12 to 14% of Australians still smoke, uh, mm -hmm. and they're what we refer to as a hardened smoker. And that's that's not our term. That is a term used by tobacco treatment specialists. And what that means is a hardened smoker is someone who has tried quitting smoking and they just won't. They are addicted. Uh, yeah. And unfortunately, these are people who tend to be working class. They don't have a lot of money to, rub, to, 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 to put together. Uh, and they're spending hundreds of dollars per week on mm. cigarettes. And the mm. vast majority of that money is going to the federal government and plugging holes in the budget. So that's the probably more cynical point of view, but it seems that if people switch to vaping and they can't tax vaping the same way that they tax cigarettes, mm. there's a pretty big budget black hole. Mm. Mm. So there is an argument, though, and certainly in the popular discourse, there's an argument that says because vaping comes in more attractive flavors that it may become a gateway for younger people to come into sort of the habit and then they might move on to, to cigarettes uh, or that that just by virtue of normalizing a new type of, of smoking, as it's incorrectly called, but called nevertheless, that this is somehow poor form. Um, what, what is the international evidence actually indicate regarding the, the public response, the non-smokers response to vaping being legalized? Are we seeing it as a gateway? The short answer is no. So so what you're talk, touching on is the, this gateway theory that a lot of anti-vaping bureaucrats in Australia push. And, and their argument is, as you said, that if you legalize vaping, kids will access it, they'll like that, and then they'll move on mm -hmm. to cigarettes. Now, in terms of international evidence, that is not the case. Uh, mm -hmm. Every westernised country who has legalised vaping is still seeing a reduction in youth smoking rates, regardless yeah, of the right. fact that vapes are legalised. So if, if, if ready access to vaping products led to smoking, then you would think that in countries where vaping is readily accessible, youth mm. smoking rates would go up, and they're not. Mm. Uh, mm. Now, yes, some underage people access vaping products. When we were kids... Some people access cigarettes. You're never going to fully stamp that out. Yeah. Uh, now, that's sort of the top line evidence. The other thing is just at a, at, at a logical level, it doesn't make sense. So your average pack of cigarettes is $40 to $50, mm. and it tastes awful. It tastes like a bushfire. Yeah. Your average vape is anywhere from $15 for a cheap sort of pre-filled pod to maybe $30, and that'll last you way longer than a pack of smokes ever will. Uh, some people mm. will last them a week, two weeks. Some people even up to a month. The, and, and more importantly, they can pick their flavours. You can get a whole raft of flavours. There are fruit fruit flavours, there are dessert flavours, anything like that. You can even just get pure mint or if you like the tobacco flavour, you can get that as well. The idea that someone would go from a product that's $15 that lasts them a week to $50 a pack mm -hmm. that tastes worse and mm -hmm. kills them doesn't make mm -hmm. logical sense. Uh, and, it's, mm -hmm. and that's just anecdotally and logically speaking. Then you look at the international mm -hmm. evidence Youth smoking rates in New Zealand are declining. Youth smoking rates in the UK are declining. Youth smoking rates in the US are declining. So it, it, it doesn't stack up. And, and those three that you just mentioned, New Zealand, UK, US, these aren't jurisdictions that have taken a different approach to nicotine in vaping because it's not the vaping only that we're talking about. It's the nicotine in the vaping. Right. You're saying they've allowed that to happen and they're actually seeing the opposite of what the naysayers are claiming here in Australia. That's correct. So they've, they've all legalised nicotine vaping products as a consumer product. Yep. You can go into yep. a store and buy it. And they are not seeing children then transition to smokes. It's just yeah. it's just not happening.
So at, at a regulatory level, we've got multiple layers of ban. We actually, the, my understanding, and this is going back in my memory banks a little while, my understanding is that uh, nicotine in vapes is scheduled or at least was scheduled alongside hard drugs classified in the same uh, category. Please update me if that's if that's changed. But there are yeah, a number but- of regulatory barriers in the way. Why is this happening? Yeah, so, so for some reason, nicotine in its purest form is, is is scheduled via the Therapeutic Goods Administration at the same level as hard drugs like heroin. So mm. I think it's Schedule 7 off the top of my head. Uh, so in, in some bizarre way, the TGA looks at heroin, uh, and I've actually lost a sister of heroin overdose. Uh, mm. So they look at that, and then they look at nicotine liquids, and they go, same product. Now, we just know that's not the case it's not uh, and, and and the most ridiculous thing out of all of this is is that sort of what their forward facing policies look like so in the public mm-hmm. eye these things are regulated the same way as heroin is uh they give the implication that smoke uh, vaping is just as bad if not worse than vaping sure uh, sorry sure. Than, than, than smoking but then when they're actually asked about it by politicians in senate estimates and inquiries they openly admit that vaping is less harmful so they almost talk out two sides of their mouth. So when they're actually, you know, put to the grindstone and, and and are required to answer questions, they'll openly admit that vaping is less harmful, but they're still scheduling these products or nicotine products in the same way that they schedule uh, uh, heroin and others. Well, that's that's an extraordinary thing you said there. For those that don't know, Senate estimates or, or testifying in front of a Senate committee, uh, if you lie, you can get into incredibly serious trouble. So yes. if they're saying two different things, the one that they say in front of Senate estimates, that's the truth. That's the one where they're telling the truth because because the consequences for not doing so are, are so much higher. So you're telling me that these people actually know better and we know that they know better because of what they say in front of Senate estimates and, and yes. Senate inquiries, and yet they continue to say the other in public. Yeah, so they, so so they know that these products are less harmful. They they openly admit that. But now they'll sometimes try and debate to what level these products are less harmful to try and obfuscate the issue. But when asked very pointedly, do you think vaping products are less harmful than cigarettes? They will almost always say yes. I don't think I've seen a single public health bureaucrat say otherwise. Uh, and yet, when you go and you poll the average voter in Australia, they now think that vaping products are as harmful or more harmful than cigarettes. Mm. Uh, now, that didn't used to be the case. When we first started our organisation, we ran a few polls. About two-thirds of Australians believed that vaping was less harmful, which is correct. That is, The scientific literature shows that. Uh, mm. And for some reason, it's gone the other way. Now, they didn't get to that position by mistake. Uh, they have been led to that position by very spurious public advocacy campaigns. Yeah. Look, Brian, that's all we have time for. But just before we sign off, if someone wanted to get in touch with you, what's the organisation? How would they get in touch with you, either to support your work or to find out more? Yeah, so legalisedvaping.com.au is our website. There's contact forms on the website if you want to reach out. Otherwise, flick me an email straight to my email, which is info at legalisedvaping.com.au. Perfect. Brian Mallow, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Topher Field, and I wouldn't be able to do this without the help of my incredible supporters. So go to topherfield.net, scroll down a little bit, and you'll see there's a couple of different ways you can support me and help me to do more of this sort of work. You can buy some merchandise, you can give a one-off donation by buying me a coffee through PayPal, or you can jump onto my subscribe star and become an ongoing supporter. All of those links are available at topherfield.net. Don't forget to like, subscribe, leave a comment, and make sure you join my email list as well so that I can still keep in touch with you even when I do inevitably get cancelled. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video.